in the Holy Spirit, one only God. Amen. I invite you to uh, turn in your Bibles uh, with me to Romans chapter 12. That can be found on page 1123 in the Pew Bible. And uh, we're going to uh, be considering uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, for sure this week and um, next week. And uh, perhaps uh, yet one week further um, toward the end of the month uh, when... I return from family leave. But uh, wanting to focus upon the Christian life, uh, wanting to focus upon uh, the the shape of the Christian life and uh, the life of the body particularly. This is something that um, we talked about at our last men's study. Uh, Something that it's important that we be reminded of regularly. Uh, But this morning, we're just going to be reading verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12 and uh, meditating upon this. Uh, So give attention then to the reading of God's Word, Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There ends the reading of God's word, and may he add his blessing to it as we meditate upon it this morning. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, friends, uh, one of the uh, perpetual difficulties uh, of understanding the Christian life uh, pertains to the matter of motivation. What is the motivation for our obedience? Um, And Uh, Again and again, uh, we find that that, uh, a spirit of legalism creeps into the church. Uh, A kind of a a sense of of obligation. God has done this, so I must do that. Um, And along with this this legalism, however, this legalism brings in with it a whole uh, lot of very undesirable things. Um, It it brings in uh, a kind of joylessness in the Christian life. And uh, by extension, this joylessness then also leads to what you could call a censorious or a judgmental spirit of one another. But God, again and again and again, uh, from the beginning of his word to the end of his word, brings us back to reckon with the question of motivation. Now, all of us would acknowledge at some level, even those of you who perhaps do not know the Lord, um, but but you recognize uh, that God is real, that God does in fact exist, all of us recognize at some level that there is some kind of obedience that ought to be present in our lives. There there is some kind of conformity to the law of God that that ought to be present in our lives. And and this is because I I think uh, of what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, or uh, the fact that the law of God is actually written upon the heart of man. That uh, even before uh, the, the Sinai, where... God speaks to Moses and God uh, inscribes these Ten Commandments that we've read earlier in our service upon these stone tablets. Even before that, the law of God is written on the heart. 
And so it is that even the most ungodly of people have a sense of ethics. They have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Now, often that sense of ethics is deeply distorted. Um, it's idiosyncratic, meaning that, that it's uh, deeply unique to each person. But every person has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. And our hearts, our consciences condemn us when we transgress this law of the heart. But Paul, in Romans chapter 12, deals so beautifully with the question, not only of the Christian life, what the Christian life is like and, and ought to look like, but first and, and foremost, perhaps in some sense, what the motivation for Christian living is. And so that has influenced uh, our choice of a theme this morning. You could just draw a line through the theme that's in your bulletin. And we're going to use as our theme words drawn uh, directly from our text. Our theme this morning is in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy, what? Well, two things. Uh, as we consider this, uh, this idea of God's mercy and, and uh, what kind of a response God's mercy uh, evokes or provokes in the heart, uh, consider first of all that it provokes uh, this moti- or, or provokes this idea of offering ourselves as living sacrifices. That's our first of two points. Offering ourselves, we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Uh, Paul uh, begins here in chapter 12 with the word, uh, therefore. Therefore, I urge you, brothers. And and of course, uh, when we see therefore, we ought to ask, what is it therefore? Well, um, we could turn uh, to the immediate context here, uh, verse, uh, chapter 11. Um, we'll read a few verses here at the end of chapter 11, um, beginning with verse 33. Um, if your Bible is uh, notated like mine, uh, you have a very apt title of this section that says doxology. What is doxology? Well, doxology is, is really to proclaim the glory of God. And, and this is exactly what Paul does, beginning in verse 33. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Paul has been building to this point in the letter, beginning with uh, Romans 1, verse 1. And, and if you're familiar with Romans, many of you are, uh, you see, first of all, that Paul, as an expert lawyer, makes an ironclad case against every person, every human being. Um, he he uh, brings uh, the Gentiles under condemnation. He brings the Jews under condemnation. Those who have uh, received the special revelation, the word of God, come under condemnation for not obeying it. Those who have not received the word of God come under condemnation for disobeying what they see revealed of God in his creation. The, the, the pronouncement is condemnation upon the whole human race. But then beginning in chapter 3, there is this declaration of the righteousness of God which is revealed apart from the law. separate from the law, that is. A righteousness revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, who God made to be sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God, to borrow from what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then he goes on to, to, to examine the Christian life, but he comes all the way to the, 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 the pinnacle, the mountaintop in Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the therefore. This is what the therefore is there for. Paul is saying, in view of everything that I've said to this point, 
in view of, of all that we've looked at from the, uh, from the Old Testament Scriptures, all that we've explained from the Old Testament Scriptures, all that we've explained about the love of God in Christ Jesus, that love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit, Romans chapter 5, in view of all of that, now, this is how we ought to live. And how is that? I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, no, notice here that the word um, rendered mercy in our translation is actually plural, and I think that that's helpful. Mercies. Because we're not talking simply about um, one facet of God's, uh, of God's kindness, one facet of God's mercy, but his mercies. And, and actually, the word that he uses here, different than the word most often used for mercy in the New Testament, is a word that ties directly to a corresponding Hebrew word. And, and the, the, the Hebrew word is, is uh, very illustrative because it's a word that it can be used of a woman's womb. And, and so it refers actually, uh, by extension, when used of God and translated mercy, the, the, the kind of uh, what you call, might call the mothering love of God. Now, don't, don't fret and don't fear, uh, because God is revealed as He, okay? I'm not, I'm not going to depart from that. And yet, the, the figures of speech uh, that we find in the, the Old and New Testament are diverse. They're, and they're diverse for the sake of descript. Uh, description. Now think about that child as it grows inside of its mother's womb. Is it not true? Fathers, um, we, we follow the pregnancies of our wives, but there's always like a distance, right, between us and that child. Uh, the bonding with that child for, for men is hindered until uh, we really hold that baby. But for the mother, from the moment of conception, um, that baby is literally a part of her. They are interchanging uh, blood, and, and whatever affects the mother affects the child, whether for good or for ill, and, and not just um, biologically, but emotionally as well. Well, the, the Apostle Paul, he uses this illustration. This is, this is what he's describing, is this nurturing love of God this unforgetting mercy of God. He talks about in, in uh, the Old Testament to use another one of these motherly illustrations, a sooner might a nursing mother forget her child, her nursing child, than that the Lord his, your God would forget you. This is the kind of mercy that God has had has for us. And he says, therefore, then, that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Now, isn't that an interesting uh, illustration, be, or, uh, uh, illustrate, uh, command, rather, an interesting command? Because there's, there's an oxymoron in, the, uh, in this, isn't there? Uh, boys and girls, uh, you know a lot about sacrifices, right? Um, some of you have just been studying the, the tabernacle uh, service and the design of the tabernacle, but one thing that the sacrifices all had in common was what? They all died. Death was actually a part of the sacrificial system, right? Um, it, it's inconceivable that, that these animals would be presented to God as living sacrifices. But everything has changed now that Jesus has come. And, and, and uh, what, what Paul is saying is, first of all, that God uh, has no desire for a living or for a, a dying sacrifice anymore. And why is that? It's because, as the author to the Hebrews says, that Jesus has offered once for all a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice, that you do not need to labor today to fashion a covering for your sin. You do not need today 
to repay God for the sins that you've committed. And in fact, you cannot c cover your sins and you cannot satisfy God, repay him for the sins that you've committed. And that is not what God requires of you because those sins are covered, they are atoned for, they are satisfied, they are repaid in the person and in the sacrifice of Jesus. And so now what, what Paul's exhortation to uh, the Romans and, and uh, in the Spirit to us is, is to present ourselves as living sacrifices. But this drives really to the heart of the whole sacrificial idea to begin with, because God never desired the blood of animals to begin with, right? Um, the, the, the blood of animals was, uh, the sacrifice of animals was not an end in and of itself, uh, for we find uh, the Lord speaking through Samuel to Saul, who has disobeyed the Lord and, and in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And what Samuel says uh, to Saul is that the Lord says, it's not sacrifice that I desire, it's obedience. Uh, it, all the way, if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, here we find this, this pristine man and this pristine woman. And, and the foundation of their uh, fellowship with God is not... Uh, the, some kind of sacrificial system, but the call on their lives is to obey God, to live and walk in communion with God. And, and that is the call to us, dear brothers and sisters, this morning. It is to present ourselves as living sacrifices. And the apostle, uh, the way that he phrases this, views this really as a once uh, for all. As, uh, he, he's viewing the offering in and of itself. Now, it's, the reality is that this is something that we have to do repeatedly, and even repeatedly uh, throughout the course of a day. Uh, you know, you, you picture uh, Isaac, okay, on the altar, boys and girls. You remember this, right? Uh, Genesis chapter 22. Now, what we sometimes miss is how old Isaac is at the point that this is all happening. Sometimes I think we think of, of Isaac as a, a little boy, or as a very young boy, like a, an elementary school-aged boy, and, and his, his daddy is putting him on the altar, um, and, and the reason that he's being kept there is because his daddy is forcing him. But Isaac is at bare minimum 16 years of age, and Abraham over 100 years old at this point. Who do you think is stronger? You see, Isaac is there, and he's there willingly in obedience to his father. This is what God is calling us to. From Romans chapter 12, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Notice, by the way, the extreme fleshliness of the gospel. And I don't mean fleshly as in the, the sinful sense, right? But there is this kind of higher life Christianity that is hyper-spiritualized. But that's not what Paul's talking about. You see, the body is not in and of itself bad, but the body uh, ought to be presented to God. What God desires uh, uh, from us is not simply a part of us, like a part of our mind or a part of our heart, but what he des uh, desires is all of us. The body and the soul, the, the whole life. What God calls us to put on the altar is the whole life. And... and uh, to, to reckon ourselves then as belonging to him. Now, think about it this way. Um, we're familiar with, uh, with selling and buying, right? And particularly um, with selling and buying houses, I think makes a helpful illustration. Now, it seems inconceivable, right, that we buy a house from somebody and we um, get to the period of, of closing, uh, to the end of the terms of contract, the house is to be turned over to us, and we show up at our house ready to move in, but the former tenants are still there. We would rightly be very concerned, and, and we would rightly be pursuing some kind of action in order to take possession of what we have purchased. Well, the same thing applies with uh, our bodies, our lives pertaining to God. You were bought with a price. That's the message of the Bible. That you do not belong to yourself. That you do not belong to Satan. That you do not belong, first and foremost, to your friends and your family. 
but that you belong to God. He's purchased you at the most uh, costly price. You can imagine no price higher than the blood of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, sacrificed in your place. So then we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now this cuts, this cuts deep, I think. But maybe we don't realize at first how, how it cuts deep. So let's bring this down a little bit more to the brass tacks. How many of you have ever asked the question, how much am I supposed to give to God? Is this not a question that we ask? Uh, now, the truth is this, guys. Can we just call the truth like it is and say, we nickel and dime God. We are nickel and dimers. Because constantly, uh, at a more or less conscious level, we are uh, reckoning in our minds, what is the least amount? We wouldn't put it quite as brassy as that. But what is the least amount that I can give to God while sliding through. And Paul calls us to a completely different way of reckoning about our lives. There is no least amount. You see, uh, there is a one-for-one -one exchange here, right? God has given His Son on our behalf, and now what we are to give to God in return is our whole self. Not 10% of our self, the tithe, right? Or... or uh, 15% because we're a little bit above and uh, beyond generous. But we are to give all of ourselves, all of our thought, all of our heart, all of our intellectual capacity, our whole strength, everything. We're to give to God. Are you nickeling and diming God today? What that indicates is that you're not reckoning with the generosity of God toward you. What has God spared? What, what is God holding back from you? What has God held back from you? The answer is nothing. He, he's given his very best, and in his very best, he's given us everything else besides. Right? <laughs> you ever think about it that way? It's not that, that God gave us the very best, like, like Jesus said, you know, maybe what we would even call Jesus 80% of what God has. But he gives us everything that he has. He gives us himself in his son. And, and that's why Paul says that the, um, what's translated here, this is your spiritual, I, I prefer the translation reasonable, logical. This is your reasonable act of worship. That's the, the, the real meaning of the word here. Uh, logikos, okay? It, it pertains to the mind. It pertains to how we reckon, how we uh, account of ourselves. And, and he's, he's saying that right thinking determines that my whole life belongs to God. Now, that's true, of course, simply by virtue of creation. But that is particularly true by virtue of redemption, in view of God's mercy, present yourselves as living sacrifices. Holy, that is set apart, consecrated. This is how we are to think of ourselves. Uh, here's a thought. Are you struggling with sin? Uh, do you struggle with uh, a kind of unclean way of thinking, an unclean way of speaking, or an unclean... Are there things that you do that that you know are unclean. What we need to do more and more, what we need to do as we rise in the morning and what we need to remind ourselves uh, as we go uh, throughout the day is to remind ourselves that we have been set apart for God's service. A story I was told once, I think, illustrates the, the, the point abundantly clearly. Um, there was a, a Christian youth camp and... Um, so a great large group of, of young people with their leaders head out to camp for a week. Uh, what, what the young men discovered uh, very quickly when they arrived was that, unfortunately, the men's bathroom wasn't working. 
So, as they tried to figure out what they were going to do about this, they located a very large container from the kitchen. And I will not fill in the blanks of what they used the container for. You can figure it out yourself. Well, now they come to the end of the week. It's Friday, and uh, on Friday night, they always have a big soup supper. And the, the, the uh, young ladies are in the kitchen, and they're saying, where's that big container that we use every year to serve soup? We can't, we've looked everywhere. Like, how could that thing go missing? It's so big. And the guys are going... So a few of them run out back, empty of its contents, and they scrub it, and they scrub it, and they bleach it, and they bleach it. They bring it into the kitchen. The girls know none the better. Now dinner is served. How many boys do you think ate out of that container? This many. You see, <laughs> they recognized that that had been polluted. It was not, in their minds, a fit vessel for a dinner to be served in. But that's how we ought to reckon of ourselves pertaining to the Lord. I'm not a fit vessel for sin. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little feet, where you go. You take the Lord with you where you go. You take the Lord with you when you see when you hear, where have you been this week? What have you been listening to this week? What have you seen this week? What have you said this week? Are these things in keeping with being sacred vessels, living sacrifices, set apart and holy to God? Would you be ashamed if these things were put up in front of this whole group here? And yet God saw and he heard it all. We so often care more about what other people think than what God who sees and knows everything thinks, don't we? It's bizarre, it's stupid because we know better. And yet that's how we are. We need to reckon with God's mercies. That's the solution here. Because when we reckon with God's mercies, when we begin to understand uh, just the, 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 uh, with what Paul talks about, right? Um, is it, is it uh, Ephesians 3? The, the height and the width and the depth and the breadth of the love of God in Christ Jesus, when we really begin to sink into that ocean, right? A vast ocean. Think about the Atlantic Ocean. Think about the Pacific Ocean. Think about how huge these oceans are. I mean, uh, the reality, I was, I was hearing a little bit about Christopher Columbus again this week. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of humorous, right? Because he was under a complete misconception with the rest of the people of his day about how it, vast the world was. And so he uh, ended up in the Caribbean and he th thought he was in somewhere very different. But as vast as those oceans are, they are incomparable. They are a drop in the bucket compared to the love of God in Christ Jesus. Most of us walk around with a small God, with a small Jesus, with a small love for us, we need, to, we need to get into the Word of God. We need to get to the foot of the cross. We need to reckon with that love. We need to begin to soak it into the fire. And it's a phrase that perhaps many of us in this uh, room have used, and it's the phrase, debt of gratitude. I believe that entirely misses the point. The whole point is that our debt fountain of your love for God when you come face to face with his love for you. Then you'll desire to serve you fully and fruitfully all the days of our life. We pray that you would work these things in our hearts by your spirit, for we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen.